Uh, the final talk for this session is going to be given by Dr. Henry Clausen, who's a professor of ophthalmology here at GHI. Um, you know, the, the phrase bench to bedside is bandied about, and a lot of people, we all like to think, a lot of us like to think that we do translational medicine, but there's very few people who do it from beginning to end, from basic science, bench work, proof of concept, to clinical trial, to startup, to tech transfer, the soup to nuts. And um, Dr. Henry Clausen is, is that kind of researcher. And the title of his talk is Retinal Progenitor Cells for Treatment of Retinitis Pigmentosa. Please welcome Dr. Henry Clausen. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks to Chris for inviting me here today. Um, and I'd also like to point out my disclosure statement. As you heard, uh, I'm involved in the company JSite, and uh, I also have IP related to what I'm going to discuss today. Uh, my talk is uh, made a lot easier because uh, Steve Schwartz just went over most of it, so <laughs> maybe we can go to lunch early. Um, but seriously, I've got some uh, trial data to show you today, so you might want to stick around. So as you've heard, uh, retinal degenerations is a very diverse collection of conditions. Um, and uh, the key point is that the photoreceptors are a, a common denominator that uh, represent the uh, final common pathway for visual loss. And uh, in RP, it's the uh, photoreceptors that are really ground zero of the problem, whereas in AMD, as you just heard, you have the interaction of the RPE with the, with the uh, photoreceptors. So by selecting RP, uh, we've somewhat simplified uh, our challenge, at least conceptually. Um, so we could, how are we going to try and help the photoreceptors? We could try to go for cell replacement, or we could try to preserve and enhance the function of those cells which remain, in other words, a neuroprotective strategy. And it's that neuroprotective strategy uh, that we've opted for, even though we've done a lot of work in both, uh, using both of these strategies. So how is it we're planning to um, neuroprotect in RP? And here I want to break it down a little bit to give you a little more of our rationale, at least going in uh, to this project. And that is that RP reflects a, a d disease in which the rod photoreceptors are expressing the mutant uh, genes, and uh, however, the cones are more important to human vision, and yet these cones are not expressing the mutation that causes the disease. Nevertheless, the cones eventually die as a form of bystander damage um, related to the, the progressive degeneration that occurs. So if we could rescue these cone photoreceptors, even if we just rescued cones, which aren't expressing the mutant uh, phenotype directly, uh, we could have a huge impact on the course of the disease. So that's basically our, our rationale going in. Now, it's one thing to say we want to um, preserve cone photoreceptors, but the next question is how are you going to do it? Now, I'm going to skip a lot of work here, but just kind of cut to the chase a little bit by saying that we've selected this retinal progenitor cell as our cell of interest. And so the main thing I want to do right now is distinguish between an RPC and an embryonic stem cell like you just heard about. And so the key point is that the ES cell comes from the pre-implantation blastocyst. Um, when you take these cells and grow them in the dish, you get a pluripotent cell line. These cells are immortal, and they can make any cell in the body. Um, if you wait um, until a fetus is developing and histogenesis has begun, uh, if you take the developing retina, not the mature retina, but the developing retina, and you put those cells in a dish, what you end up growing are retinal progenitor cells, and that's what we're going to be using. So now I'll just talk about a, an overview of our project here. I started this work at Chalk uh, back in 1998. That means I've been working on this 20 years. Um, so it's about time we had something to show for it. Um, and again, we're going with these retinal progenitors. I started working with the human cells 
back uh, 20 years ago. Some of the features of these cells, just to elaborate a little more on their, their characteristics, um, whereas I said the uh, ES cells are immortal, um, ours are not. They're, they're telomerase negative or telomerase low. They don't um, propagate forever, but they do expand for a while. Um, so the downside means we have to go back and rederive the cells periodically, even though we can get uh, an expansion out of them. Uh, the good side is that they're, they're incapable of making teratomas, and in general, they're less tumor prone. In fact, we haven't seen any tumors with the human cells. Um, another aspect I touched on was that they're fate restricted. Again, they're from the developing retina, and they're restricted to making retinal cell types. That's a problem if you're trying to treat diabetes, maybe, but it's not a problem for us because we're concentrating on retinal conditions. Uh, so that's okay. And the fact that they're restricted to the retina may relate to the fact that they demonstrate diminished immunogenicity when they're transplanted as allografts. And that's a, a real nice side effect of um, using a fate-restricted cell. Now, our initial disease target is RP. Uh, we like the focal nature of the degeneration plus the severity of it, the lack of treatment. All these things uh, kind of define a clear unmet need. Now, the downside is it's a very severe disease, so it's going to be hard to get any kind of signal out of this. Um, the fact that it's a rare disease uh, gives you certain um, regulatory incentives at this point in time. Um, so we've done a lot of work in animal models, both in rodents and in larger animals, and I'm just going to skip right over that. Um, but the point is, yes, you have to get from bench to bedside if you want this to be a therapy, and that means at some point you quit picking a new species to fiddle around in, and you have to take your plan to the FDA in the form of a pre-meeting and discuss what it is you think you're going to be doing in humans, and they'll give you feedback in terms of what your clinical package should look like, meaning what they expect you to present to them uh, when you come back and ask formally for permission to begin a clinical trial, and that falls under this idea of IND. Um, so here's an overview of our preclinical package, just to give you an orientation of some of the work involved. Um, the first part is called CMC. That's the manufacturing of the cells. Um, so the cells that you use in the lab may not be eligible for use in a human. I think that's uh, intuitive to anybody who's worked in a lab. Um, so you're going to have to re-derive the cells and um, manufacture them under GMP-compatible conditions, uh, knowing that these cells uh, could end up in a human being. Um, then you're going to subject these cells to a number of tests. Uh, importantly, there's the toxicology studies. These are intensive and uh, expensive as well. Um, to demonstrate to the FDA that um, you have evidence of safety in animals before you go into a human. Um, and although you've already demonstrated uh, your proof of concept in an animal at this point, you have to replicate it with your GMP product uh, to show that it retains the capacity to have a treatment effect um, since you're going to be going into humans now. Um, and finally, you're going to want to um, have a clinical plan that's going to be a synopsis of what it is you intend to do in humans. In other words, how many people you plan to enroll, uh, who's going to be eligible, how you're going to follow them up, what kind of tests, and so on. Uh, so all that has to be prepared, and that's your IND application. We filed that in December of 2014. So now I'm just going to kind of look at each of these uh, subjects and just touch on them lightly. Uh, the cell manufacturing, this is a quick way to put everybody to sleep. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because the FDA is the one who's going to be looking at this very closely, and they will not be asleep. So um, just be forewarned, if you're interested in cell therapies and you're developing one, you're going to have to pay a lot of attention to CMC if you don't want a rude awakening. Um, then the safety studies, I'll just touch on a, a few aspects of this. One is, of course, you want your cells uh, to be safe. Um, and the key point for us is that we don't want the culture 
uh, conditions to affect the safety of the cells. And the, one of the key things we're looking at is the karyotype. In other words, excessive passaging of the cells can lead to abnormalities in the chromosomes. And those kind of abnormalities are not infrequently associated with bad behavior, and by that I mean tumors. Um, so it's very reassuring to have a normal karyotype going in. Um, another thing is you're going to uh, put your cell product into the intended target site, in this case the vitreous cavity of the eye, um, and then you're going to allow these animals to survive over different time periods, and you're going to see what happens to the animals. And so uh, we went out to eight months, and there was no evidence of tumor formation, um, but we had survival of the grafts in the vitreous. Um, and meanwhile, you're looking at the surrounding tissues for evidence of trouble there as well. Um, another important component is the biodistribution. That means how your drug is distributed in the body. Now, we put these cells into the vitreous cavity, and then we looked at tissues outside of the eye, uh, including the other eye, the brain, and peripheral tissues, and blood. And at no point did we see any evidence of human DNA in any of these peripheral tissues. So our conclusion was that the cells had never left the eye. Um, so obviously that's very favorable from a safety perspective. Um, here's a quick look at our proof of concept. You know, what is it we're trying to do? And here um, we're gonna, I'm just going to touch on the anatomical stuff and then get to the, the functional on the next slide. Um, here's the basic idea. If this is the retina, um, then this is the vitreous cavity, and this big blob in the middle, that's the transplant. So the cells are injected as a suspension of cells like you just heard about. Um, but these particular cells, when they're injected, they like to aggregate with each other. They have improved survival, and they really have this preference for forming these neurospheres, and that's what you see here. So the cells just aggregate together, form a graft that's visible to the clinician, um, and they're just suspended here in the vitreous. Um, and from this position, they're going to slowly differentiate spontaneously, and they're going to secrete the factors that are going to impact cells in the host retina and result, we hope, in the uh, rescue effect. Um, so <clears throat> this, this is a rat retina that's been uh, made into a whole mount. And from there, um, it's been labeled with antibodies uh, for rhodopsin, which labels uh, rod photoreceptors, and a middle wavelength coneopsin to label some of the cones. And um, then it's subjected to confocal microscopy of this whole mount, and then the images are put together into these montages in these different quadrants. And the reason we do different quadrants is because the retina in the RCS rat degenerates at different rates, so you have to compare similar quadrants to have a meaningful comparison. Um, but here's a control quadrant where you see the devastation. The lack of signal here means that there aren't photoreceptors present. And here's what we're looking to see in this on FOSS view. We're looking down at the layer of the rods and cones, and we see all these profiles that are either red or green, and those are indicative of individual photoreceptors uh, that are still surviving in this eye. And uh, so that, that would seem to be very preferable to that, even if it's not a, a normal retina. Here's a functional readout. We look at different measures. Uh, we have a uh, optomotor test that's um, nice because it's in the uh, awake alert animal, um, and we see a response here. It, it's, it's the rodent equivalent of an eye chart, if you will, because it, it has some measure of visual resolution, which is sort of like acuity if you think about it. Um, and so in the uh, green bar, we see the, the better performance of the uh, cell-treated animals over shams and untreated controls. Um, the downside to this test is it's somewhat dependent on the person performing it, so we've used the same person every time. But we, the point is we want to back it up with something that's more of a gold standard, and here we turn to the ERG, which is uh, certainly how 
uh, retinitis pigmentosa is diagnosed in clinical patients. Um, our job's made a little tougher because the rodent retina doesn't have nearly the signal of the human retina, um, but uh, if you're careful, you can collect that data. And here again, we see a sham and untreated controls. Uh, the B wave amplitude is here, whereas as we start adding more and more cells, uh, we're getting um, improved treatment, although there appears to be something of a plateau. But the point is, uh, we have some benefit in B wave amplitude based on cell treatment. Okay. Um, then here's a quick rundown of what we propose to do in the clinic. Again, we're using allogeneic cell product. It's a progenitor cell. Um, it's, uh, we're targeting RP, and we're going to use an intraocular injection. So this is something that can be performed under topical anesthesia. And we're not going to immunosuppress these patients. So we're going a little bit out on a limb there to see what happens because we saw a good survival when allogeneic cells were used in animals. Um, and then again, I want to emphasize that we're looking for a neurotrophic response, not uh, cell replacement. Okay, so as we um, get from the IND into the clinic, this part of the project was funded by CIRM. It's a, a large disease team grant that funded both the uh, preclinical and in initial trial. Uh, we partnered with NCATS for um, some of the large animal studies that were involved in the preclinical package. Uh, we found a J site um, who licensed the intellectual property from the UC Regents, and uh, of course the interactions with the FDA that um, are enumerated here, uh, eventually resulting in the active IND in April of 2015, um, which allowed us to launch the clinical project. So our cells were manufactured at UC Davis. Um, they're then, then shipped down to UC Irvine here to the stem cell center, which you see right behind Jing and I, um, where the cells are kept, just some of them, that are um, getting ready for the patient. So uh, when, when a patient's uh, ready to go, we take a sample, thaw it out, and prepare it for use in the human in our cell preparation laboratory. Then. Uh, the reason I'm carrying the box is that's the cells that have been prepared for the patient, and we take them to the clinical site um, along with uh, the small amount of paraphernalia needed to do the injection. Um, for the first site, uh, we had two clinical sites, UC Irvine and Retina Vitreous Associates in UCI. And the first patient was dosed at UCI, and this is the moment of the first dosing. So this is like Steve's image. You just saw um, the excitement that was there to see something new happening. Um, and uh, so we broke our patients into two cohorts. The point to make here is that these patients are late in the disease. So that comes with all the, the caveats uh, in terms of trying to see a treatment effect. Um, so end-stage RP, these people have very few photoreceptors left. Um, so the first people we treated uh, were hand motions vision, and um, the remainder of that cohort were all legally blind, in other words, 2,200 or worse, um, in addition to having extremely restricted visual fields, um, if any. Um, and then um, following that, we uh, moved to a cohort of patients with somewhat better vision, um, but still quite impaired. So we started enrolling people right away. Uh, that was in June of 15. Uh, this is a single eye injection, a single injection into the worst seeing eye. We started with a low dose of half a million cells and worked our way up uh, through four different dose levels, one, two, three million. Uh, and we completed enrollment in July of uh, 2016, and every patient uh, completed the trial. So the, the final endpoint was a 12 months follow-up. Um, in terms of safety, the safety profile for this was uh, good. You can imagine the, the procedure is pretty straightforward. There was, of course, some uh, conjunctival injection and eye pain related to the injection, that kind of thing. A little bit of inflammation. 
um, but no serious events. There was one SAE, but uh, after a workup, it was deemed to be unrelated to the cells. Um, and importantly, uh, there were none of the uh, bugaboos you might be worried about from a stem cell injection like tumors. There was no uh, evidence that the cells were contributing to epiretinal membranes. The reason I phrase it like that is some of the patients had epiretinal membranes to begin with, but there was no evidence that the cells were contributing to their problems or extending that problem or creating new membranes. Um, and importantly, we didn't see evidence of immune rejection. There was long-term survival of the grafts uh, throughout the trial. Um, in terms of efficacy, uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, point out that this is a, this is a safety trial. This is a single-arm, open-label study, so it uh, has all the restraints that you heard about from uh, Steve Schwartz. Um, this is not an efficacy trial, and yet the data from this is important, and it's important to look at the efficacy because any signal you get is going to be helpful in terms of structuring your uh, efficacy, your 2B trial. Um, we chose as a primary outcome a visual acuity. Now, the good news is that's accepted by the FDA, and it's certainly the gold standard in ophthalmology. Um, the downside is this is a severe neurodegenerative disease, so this is an extremely high bar. A lot of people can't make out any letters whatsoever. Um, so um, all these patients who couldn't make out a letter, uh, we had to score them as zero. Um, so that's going to dilute the impact of anything we see. The other point is this is a neuroprotective strategy. If you think about it, the concept is that you're going to preserve function. But these people have already degenerated uh, quite a bit. And so what kind of preservation do you expect to see over a one-year time period? Um, the normal rate of degeneration in RP is about one letter per year. Um, even if um, you preserve that one letter, that's not necessarily statistically significant, and I don't think the FDA would be very excited. So I'm just diminishing expectations here because, uh, you know, neuroprotection isn't supposed to do very much on a short-term basis, and that's a challenge for anybody employing that strategy. Uh, another problem is this is an open-label study, so it's not truly masked in terms of treatment condition. <laughs> Um, so what are you going to use for your control for statistical purposes? And um, one choice is to go with the fellow I, which we did. Um, there's some caveats to that. One is that in some cases where there's like f drugs or factors that could get in the bloodstream, uh, you might have bilateral effects which will dilute your signal. Um, and then the other point is that um, the, we're treating the more affected eye, well, maybe the rate of degeneration is worse in that eye, so maybe that also works against us. So there are potential headwinds to, to using the other eyes. But that makes it a relatively uh, conservative uh, measure, and, it, and as Steve said, it, it should help uh, weed out placebo effect. Um, another way to look at it is just what's, what's the rise off a of baseline? Is there any improvement relative? Did they come out better than they went in? Um, and then another way to look at it is, okay, we know that historically people lose, on average, a letter a year, so we could say baseline minus one letter is our comparison. That would be uh, using historical controls. Um, anyway, those are the options. Well, here's the data across all patients at six months. So it's a blur of uh, different bars going in all directions. So I just want to point out right down the, the middle, the equator there, um, that's zero. So that represents baseline. And then individual patients are divided into their two eyes. And um, either it goes up or it goes down. So uh, going, a bar going down from zero is, means there's a, a decrease in vision recorded at the time point of six months. And a bar going up means it got better. Um, and then we divide them here into different um, doses. So one, two, three, four doses. You see that our patient population is weighted towards uh, the uh, lower doses, which are the people who are even more impaired than the rest of them. Um, and then in terms of uh, 
color, the orange is the treated eye and the uh, blue is the untreated eye. So what I want to point out, if you look at like um, all the bars going down, what color predominates? And well, I think you can see it's blue. So blue is the untreated eye. If you look at what's going up, it's a mix, but we see a predominance of orange. So that's suggestive uh, that treatment might have a positive effect. But as we heard that six months, maybe there's more impact of placebo effects. So what does it look like at 12 months, which is our actual endpoint? Again, we see uh, a predominance of orange going up and blue going down. Um, so it, it's suggestive of a treatment effect. Um, so um, overall, in aggregate, taking all comers in this trial, um, we saw 3.64 letters of improvement in the treated eyes. Um, using the fellow eye as a comparison. Um, the change off a of baseline was slightly better at four letters. And if we compared it to historical controls, um, that was five letters. So it looks like there's a signal there. Um, but again, this was all comers. So how about if we start looking at uh, different individuals within this treatment? Um, and here we divide it by dose. And what I just want to point out is that at the highest dose level, we start to see that there's a evidence of a bigger response, suggestive of a dose response uh, type of situation, uh, which again kind of underscores the idea that there's a real signal here. Um, and uh, you can look at the numbers off a of baseline, it was 6.3. Um, so 6.3 off a of baseline, um, if you compare the other uh, eye, we actually get a tailwind this time and it was uh, a difference of nine letters, which is uh, pretty amazing in this popu population. So um, that trial's over. The people who have finished are entered into an extension trial where they can get their other eye treated. We're also looking at other um, ways of assessing visual function in these patients other than visual acuity. Um, meanwhile, we got an RMAT uh, designation from the FDA, that's a new a designation for regenerative medicine therapies. And uh, we've started a phase 2B trial uh, based on the data I showed you that's actively enrolling. Uh, and uh, we hope to conclude enrollment later this year. Uh, we think there's a lot of other applications outside of RP for neuroprotective uh, type of treatment, uh, but I don't have time to get into that. So I'll just quickly thank people who worked on this. Uh, including Jing Yang, who's a uh, uh, force of nature working on the cells, our clinical teams at the different sites. I uh, want to point out Barry Cooperman at UCI in particular, and uh, give a nod to our folks at J site uh, who are critical to making this work. Thank you. Well, that's what we're going to find out. Um, but we think that the, uh, it stands to reason that the response will diminish and go away as the cells uh, are lost, because these graphs survive for an extended period, but not indefinitely. So as the cells disappear, um, we anticipate that the effect will disappear. Now, the good news is we have the capacity to redose these patients.